Wow, that's amazing. Uh, hey everyone, I am the first time to spend you don't know. My background, I work at PBS, PBS Digital Studios. <laughs> Incredibly honored to be here, uh, sitting with this illustrious crew of creators and educators, entertainers. Uh, so we're going to talk about that. Uh, so we'll, I'll make the introduction, so I'll try to facilitate. Let me ask one quick question. How many people think they might have a question to ask today? Okay, great. So we're gonna, I, I'm going to keep my questions to a minimum and make sure that you guys have lots and lots of time to discuss. And I have a feeling there, this is going to be a really awesome conversation. We're not going to have enough time to talk about all the things we want to talk about. So let's get going. So Destin Sandlin, ladies and gentlemen. Designing effective multimedia for physics education. Wow. 
people so that if they can go outside and look at a tree and not just be like, oh, a tree, and they, if they ask the question for themselves, what kind of tree is that? Like, I'm going to go find out what kind of tree that is. Like, that amount of empowerment is, that, that's something you can't measure. And, uh, that's what I aspire to do. Yeah, I think you can give people information. You can give them knowledge by just providing the information and they absorb that. Or you can allow them to discover the information for themselves by, you know, asking the question and then allowing them to answer it with that critical thinking that you're talking about. That's what I like to do. That's, that's the way I approach the world myself. So, YouTube allows, so the, uh, sort of, let's talk about YouTube as a platform a little bit. Destin, can I, can I interrupt real quick? Destin. Did you see that the person who made us cry last year is in the audience right now in the third? I did, bro. I did. Hi. I remember when you made me cry. No, you're not going to do it again. No, never again. For those of you who weren't here last year, which almost everyone, John and I were toughening each other up backstage. <laughs> Choke you back to your Sorry, sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah. uh, I cry easy, so take it easy. Do you, you want to hear the story? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> we open it up for questions, and we're, we're trying to figure out like, how we get there, how, how we know if we've done a good job with our videos, are we learning the people good, or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think one of the problems is that there aren't that many elements. 
I'm not just saying that. Like, I, I guess my hope that there are memories, many of them in the audience today, uh, that, that you will um, you know, be inspired by her work and by other people's work here um, to go on to you know, become uh, educators or for communicators about the educational areas of your passion, or that you'll just do it now and just start up looking at videos that do that. Um, because I, 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 I think right now, like, we just don't have, we just don't have a lot of people who are good at it, because it's a years of new thing to be good at it. I think, I think they're out there. I see them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that, that is a, a, an awesome point, and something we talk about a lot is the sort of who are, who's the next generation of kind of media educators, and who's the new generation of audience, and how do we get, how, how does this whole thing grow beyond, so we talk about diversity, right? That's big, that's really important to us at PBS, it's important to everybody here in terms of who they're reaching, but part of that is gonna be who's the person on the camera, and what is their background, and who, you know, where are they from, and what do they represent, and who identifies with them. So, you know, it's pretty obvious that there is a through line in terms of the people that are up here right now. Like, let's be frank. So, how how is this going to evolve? Um, where is the next generation of, of educational leaders, young educational leaders and media makers, going to come from? Where are we at? You know, where are we at right now? Well, you know, why are we here in this, with this sort of lineup? And is it going to change quickly or, or not? I I want to ask a question of the audience. I guess what. What is the difference between you guys and, and, and what we do? There's really no difference. The only thing is the conversations that you're having with your friends at home about things that you're learning about, we just put it on the internet. That's the only difference. So I think there's this fear. I, I get contacted by a lot of people, and I know you guys do too. I really want to start something, but I, you know, I've got to get a certain amount of funding, or I have to whatever. And, and the answer, as Derek has pointed out in some of his videos, is just do it. Even if it's wrong, or no, not wrong. <laughs> you know, you know, don't put up wrong information. Can, can, can I say that I've been wrong? I like, and I've been wrong recently. Like, yeah. I, I'm doing what I can. Uh, I'm, I'm just one guy. I, yeah, yeah, I still. Yeah. I made a video about dragonfly wings, and I mislabeled one of the holes on a dragonfly. It's so starting to sound like it's starting to sound like Greg. I've yeah, been, I've been way worse than that. The okay. point, the point is, just do something. In a world of talkers, be a thinker and a doer, and emphasize on the doing, and don't just do the thinking, because that's probably where you're at right now. So the only difference from where we are and where you are is that you haven't done it yet. Many of you probably have. I know there's several people in the audience that have great channels, but just do it. Just get out there and be the next Emily. Be the next Mike Rodenetta. Please. <laughs> <laughs> So that's, that's really what it is. So it's sort of the barriers to entry, right? The hurdles to be able to, to uh, so one is uh, obviously this YouTube digital video production world is much, much cheaper you know, with, a, with an iPhone uh, and as a you know, uh, connection to the internet that you can do what you guys do. But there's the educational piece of that too, right? So most of you have, uh, everyone has degrees that are very degrees relevance to the topics you cover, which, yeah, I was thinking of you, Mike, in particular. That's, that's so true. Dramatic hand motion. <laughs> art. Yeah, right, I'm just an art major, right? Yeah. Studio yeah. art painting, I studied landscape painting in college. I didn't take college biology. So, so there you go. So it, it really is just being a, a lifelong learner, being curious, and, and doing it. Yeah, but I think we have an obligation um, to try to develop uh, talent so that five years from now, this panel is not as white and upper middle class. Um, so I think... Uh, I, I, actually, I actually don't think that will happen by, by just waiting. I think um, we have like several millennia of history to indicate that it won't happen just by waiting. Um, so I, I, I do think that we have to, we have to, there are lots of people out there who, who, want, who, who want these opportunities. We have, to, we have to find them and we have to, we have to help them. Um, we have to get the audience and um, help them with really audiences. Yeah, uh, Henry from 
visits, he reached out, and uh, Ever Salazar works in Venezuela. So Minute Earth is created in Venezuela. Ever's here, by the way. Can you raise your hand? Where's he at? Yeah, right there. Yeah. Yeah, so Minute Earth is Dropbox from Venezuela, which is a very, uh, it's a very unstable place right now. It's Dropbox to Henry, who then uploads. Is that correct? Yeah, so that's awesome. I just want to say that. But I mean, that's an example of like Henry going out, finding a really talented person in Minute Earth, and like help, you know, help, helping him make you happen. Right. I mean, these things, uh, this, these things are combinations that need to be made like in an academic environment, too. So one thing I talk about, like, we need more women minorities, like, in public. <laughs> Um, and that is worth a ridiculous number of views to me. 
um, in, in comparison to, to ad revenue. So by doing that, it allows me to continue to um, explore the kind of topics that I'm really interested in, um, which may get fewer views. So I've recently tried something different. Um, the first first time I tried to put money in my kids' college education fund with YouTube was a video I made called "Share the Love." It was a you know, hey, send such you know a few dollars here, and then I'll keep making content and send my kids to college. I got twenty bucks out of that. <laughs> we went to dinner because it wasn't going to the college fund because it didn't work. But since then, um, I, I made a direct appeal and. Um, Patreon and Subable. Subable, John, feel free to talk about Subable. But um, these are two methods that you can use the community itself to fund what you're doing. And it's really changed, it's brought stability to my wife, my life, and my wife. <laughs> In seriousness, uh, I'll explain that. I have a 40 hour a week job. I work, like a real job. And then I go home at night and I make YouTube videos at night. And for the last four years, I haven't gone to bed at the same time as my wife, except on special occasions. But for the most part, um, I just, too much. <laughs> Don't do much. But for the most part, um, it's, it's, it's really been difficult for our relationship. And so when I started the Patreon and Subable, I was able to give my friend, uh, who's an editor, some money and said, can you please just look at all this footage, just three hours of footage I, I, I did, and just give me the good parts. And then for the last three months, I have been a better father. I've gone to sleep at the same time as my wife, and that's made my marriage better, and I think it's made my content better. And so that was funded by the community, and that's a huge deal. So thank you if you're a part of that. And if you support any of us in any way, thank you so much, because we're real people just like you, and we have things that we have to worry about. So. So that was Scott Cummings and Alex. I kind of have a, a unique position because I'm, we don't monetize the brain suit. There are no ads. There, uh, there will never probably be ads. There will, there, for the foreseeable future, we don't run ads on the show. And, um, and so I'm salaried by the institution. So whether I make a video that gets 15,000 views or 500,000 views, like I get paid the same thing at the end of the day, which gives me a lot of freedom, you know, to, to try and to and fail, you know, to try different things. And if they don't work out, like at least we try it, and I, and I can still retain that integrity that I'm not looking like how am I going to pay my rent next month and having that sort of panic. So that institutional support is has been incredibly advantageous. It's just like a different model. What do you guys? Yeah, I mean, like the, a lot of times we find that the educational matrix doesn't line up uh, with the uh, maximum CPU's interest. And when we find that, you know, Hank and I are very fortunate that we both have other, other jobs and other sources of income so we can focus on the, the educational outcome. That's very, very rare. And particularly, for, particularly for creators who are starting out, um, they have to be motivated by views because they probably don't, you know, run VidCon or run young adult moms, you know, like, so, like, there's a different kind of, um, <laughs> so, uh, so, so over the years, like, our model has changed a lot, like, um, because for many years, YouTube was the way, the only way, essentially, that Hank and I, um, like, you know, paid 
for life. Um, and I remember like one year we decided in November we were just, we, we didn't tell nerd players about this, but we just decided we would do sweeps. Because the ad rates are highest in November, um, because people are buying stuff for Christmas or whatever. So we decided that we would just do videos that we thought would get a lot of views, like we had an animal sex week. <laughs> and it, it totally backfired. First off, like people, it turns out like once you get past giraffe sex, like it's progressively less compelling, you know? Like, you're fine, they find yourself in tortoise sex. And, um, and Which I have filmed in high speed in the rainforest, by the way. I'm sure you have. <laughs> I actually did that, I'll show you some. No, I, I don't. If I had to guess a person I know. <laughs> Um, and, you know, what we found over the years is that um, for us, you know, like the model changes as, as our lives change and as much, many more people become involved in Crash Course and SciShow and, and the art assignment. Um, and, you know, the model for us is, is a hybrid now of direct support from the audience through some of all which is a monthly voluntary subscription site. The Patreon is essentially very similar. Um, and um, it's changed from a mix of that and advertising revenue. So we aren't like like Dustin, like we aren't dependent upon advertising revenue in the way that we used to be, um, but we still kind of need it. That's also allowed us not to have to do um, too much brand integration. Um, but I, I don't know. I go back and forth on whether brand integration is, is more or less intrusive to the lives of viewers than asking them for money. I don't know. Like, isn't it in some ways easier to just? Listen to some, listen to me tell you that Audible is an amazing website, which I'm sure it is. Um, um, rather than like asking me for three dollars a month, I don't know which of those is, is less intrusive in your life. Um, so we're all kind of trying to figure that out together and trying to listen to you guys help us know what's the best way. Great. So, are we ready for questions from the audience? Yes, we are very ready. I think. That was the first hand that went up right there in the front row. When you're starting out, if you have nothing, what do you do? <laughs> I think I think you are shooting yourself in the foot if you're shooting for a certain kind of demographic. You're like, I'm going to have a kids channel. Why don't you exclude everybody else? Like, just make, just making the good educational content. Like, I could have never predicted what my demographics demographics would have come out to. I I dissected on my on my channel, and that's historically something that people try to shield from their children. But young children. Or my number one views on those videos. So it's like, you know, I, I couldn't have predicted that. Do what you love. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't do, don't try to, to get a particular audience. If you are genuine and you're doing it because it's a fire on your bones and you don't explode, then people can tell. You're also... <laughs> God, you are passionate. <laughs> I don't feel that way about anything. <laughs> um, you know, if you're, if you're making stuff, obviously you're making stuff for third graders, you know, you're trying to teach um, arithmetic or you're trying to teach reading uh, skills or comprehension skills. Um, there are ways, I think, to make that accessible to a broad audience, to make it interesting to a broad audience. I, I um, while I do love um, animation and um, like I love watching Mike's videos and there's lots of editing in them, it's very hard and I don't know how it happens. Um, but like, ultimately, I, I think that effective communication um, is not not a high production value thing. Um, production values can add some add some value at the very very far edge, um, but I think there is a lot to be done um, with just a, 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 these days, you know, with an iPhone camera and a mic. I think there's also a lot to be said about getting there, right? Like it's the, like being able to watch the journey of a channel is itself a, a sort of meta story that's really really fun and really interesting. 
interesting. And so if you know that you want to eventually make something that is of a certain quality, but you can't make it at first, like what, what can you do and how can you incrementally work your way there? And that itself is another feature of the channel that is interesting. Like we look back on our original videos and cringe. We're like, we can't even, like, like looking at them, it's so different that the audio is awful, the lighting's awful, but I think perfectionism is the curse of a true artist, but you really have to cross that hurdle of saying, you know what, I'm just going to put it out there. And YouTube is the most amazing medium for that because you can learn from your mistakes or you can learn from your efforts every single week. You don't have to produce 100 videos at once and then release them, so every single day or week you're doing it, you're like, It just seems crazy. But at the same time, I find myself to be a huge fan of copyright when it comes to other people not publishing my books. <laughs> so I have a complicated relationship with it. But I'm like, this is such a stupid thing. Why do we even have this? But not for books. <laughs> Crash Course to Khan Academy. We give Crash Course to anyone who can use it. We, we, we say, you know, mash it up, do cool stuff with it. Um, you know, we want to we want to be able to make sure that, like, you don't um, rearrange my my words uh, to make me say something that I didn't say, or you know, like something that's horribly offensive. But um, but but you know, use it if it can be useful to you. Use it, um, and that's that's sort of my my worldview when it comes to stuff on the internet that are not books. <laughs> I think I'm different. Um, I've had situations where the Daily Mail newspaper in the UK has freebooted my entire videos. Woo! Yeah, caught that, huh? So, so I typically what I do is if somebody asks me, I have to say, sure, go for it. But if they're a major corporation and they try to freeboot it and they try to use it for you know their own personal gain, I usually try to send them a DCMA takedown. Am I saying that correctly, Mike? DMCA, DMCA takedown notice, but uh, if it's individuals in the classroom and stuff, I usually allow them. Yeah, actually, I take that back. If it was the day of the man, I would do the same thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've got a letter that I just like, stamp, stamp, stamp. I'm, I'm about as far left as you can get on the copy left stance, and even I would send a takedown to the day. <laughs> Um, <laughs> like, you know, it's, it can start off as a small thing, like somebody rips an image off of one of your videos, they put a caption on it, they upload it onto maybe an incredibly popular multi-million view Facebook page all about really, really enjoying science um, without a link back to your video where it came from and not sourcing the material, and that's fine, but you that person notice they can put it up. That image still exists, and that still, you see it, it pops up everywhere, it's on the front page of Reddit, it's like it's in the Daily Mail, and, and there's no connotation like back to back to the, the original source. And that's like, man, I could have educated all those jokers if they would have known where to go. I hiked for three weeks in the jungle for that. Yeah, <laughs> I killed a seal for that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's not that much of a difference. I guess the biggest difference is that we don't have like teachers and, and um, curriculum consultants telling telling me what is important about the conflict in the Central African Republic. That's just me with a with my computer and reading The Economist. <laughs> 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 
you know. Um, and I try to make that really clear that like I'm not I'm not trying to be an authority when I talk about stuff. I'm I'm just interested in it, and I want to you know. And I I'm real I, you know like Hank and I are particularly interested in complicated narratives that, that get ignored because they're complicated, like places with a truth versus simplicity, so we just kind of don't pay attention to it because we like the simple stories that make sense. Um, but I, I, I mostly want to just be like, wow, that's complicated, isn't it? And then that's the end of the video. <laughs> whereas, um, whereas in Crash Course, I try, I try to, you know, we, we try to be a little more, um, uh, yeah, to come to, come to at least some conclusions. I don't mean that like, 
metaphorical, and literally. I had to write a paper about, I had to read the bluest eye on Twelfth Night over the summer and write papers about both of them to get my D. Um, kind of failed English, and everything worked out all right for me. <laughs> The question is, how do you major in YouTube? Which is a great question. Liberal arts education? Yeah. For, for me, it was a religion major, early Islamic history. Question about uh, length of a video and how do you really make something deep that people can still digest and still watch? I mean, the thing that I would say about that is uh, if you haven't seen By Heart's 12 Tones video, uh, it's like the greatest example of a video that goes for uh, half an hour and is awesome the whole way through and has great pacing and great artistry. Obviously, By is a genius. Um, but, but uh, you know, I think you look at Vsauce and, and all the videos are sort of 10 to 15 minutes. And uh, so, so I think it, everything can be as long as it needs to be. And as, as you get better at your craft, maybe it's easier to make um, longer things. So The luxury is that we don't have an industry standard, you know? Like, and, that, and that really, that fosters the creative approach to making videos. Some things need a minute long video. Sometimes you need 15 minutes to cut up an animal. You know, sometimes it's just like, and, and so don't, don't, don't fuck yourself into that. It's as long as it needs to be. I hated to hear my teachers say that. We're like, come along with the paper, as long as it needs to be. <laughs> <laughs>
That's a great question. So the question's about, um, you know, if the video isn't the, the end-all, be-all of, of learning, which, which it isn't, um, how are the rest of us thinking about doing what Derek does so well, what he says at the end of the video, like, uh, I'm trying to figure out why this happened, and then in a couple weeks, if you haven't figured it out, I'll tell you. But, not now. <laughs> <laughs> that's normally because I gotta work it out. So, as, as Desmond pointed out in one of my videos, like, that's because you don't know. And, and sometimes it has been because I don't know. So, you know. Uh, so on the Idea Channel, um, we don't think of the, I don't think the video as the final product. It's the discussion that happens in the comment section, you know, 300 pixels below it. And so when putting a script and an episode together, the thing that we're always thinking about is how are we encouraging the, like what kind of conversation we want people to have and how do we encourage that conversation. And then a week goes by and I'll respond to, directly to comments. So the idea being, you know, you can take this time to think about it, you can write a comment like I read pretty much every comment that's left over the span of a week. Um, and, you know, hope, hope to encourage people to like, you know, you don't have to, as soon as it's out, like, don't write a good comment and then that's how it's going to get picked up. Like, you can think about it for a little while. And whether or not that comes across, like, we're not explicit about that, but, you know, I like to think that that is something that comes across. For us, um, we're trying really hard to build curriculum materials outside of um, the video so that people have um, essays and worksheets and links to links to places that they can read um, much more um, or even videos that, that, that go into more detail about this facet or that facet. It, all kinds of uh, resources. Um, so that's, we have an employee now who's working full time on that and hopefully we'll be rolling that out um, at, around the end of the year. So I'm sad to say it's No one's paying. There's no money in it. <laughs> All right, so I think we have time for one last question. I'm going to go all the way to the very back. Very back, yeah, wave your hand. You're going to have to speak very loudly. Can you hear me? Like yeah. This? yeah. All right, good. This is for Emily. Um, obviously, the Field Museum is leading the way in this online museum education sphere. Um, but what has been the greatest challenge that you face with other museum professionals and other museum educators in trying to like push this medium? So uh, let me see if I can answer it. How are we encouraging other museums to push this sort of medium? Or what challenges have you faced, particularly at the Field Museum, trying to <laughs> encourage other professionals about the medium? I think I got that challenge. You got it. Just take it. <laughs> <laughs> challenges at the museum. Yeah, institution. Yeah. Oh, you know, so I, I mean, I'm working in an environment with an institution that's existed for over a hundred years. Change doesn't happen overnight. <laughs> but I, I have been so impressed and humbled by the support that, the, that my colleagues at the Field Museum have expressed to me and, and their willingness to get on board with the rates. Like they, they get it. You know, it's not like I have to sit down and convince somebody the value of making a video about the collections. Uh, they understand. So that, that, in that way, the Field Museum is, is revolutionary. We're the only museum in the world to have an in-house YouTuber. That's awesome. Why don't more museums do that? But it's just like, sometimes you just hit resistance because of uh, change, like I said, doesn't come overnight. Um, but I've been so, so pleased and so happy uh, with that support. Wonderful. Well, with that, unfortunately, our time is out. I think that uh, education plus entertainment this past 60 minutes. Is